thank you. Uh, I am going to speak about DNS, the domain name system, DNSSEC, which is the secure way of doing DNS, and key management, which is always very important every time you want to use encryption. You need keys and you need algorithms, you know that already. And um, who am I? Well, I started out early. I had my exam from the Stockholm University in 1984, and I fell in love with the internet and the IP protocol, and not to mention DNS, but that was a little bit later. Um, and I work as a CISO in this foundation. I have been inducted to the Internet Hall of Fame, caused by the stubborn work I've been doing during the years to promote DNSSEC. So that's more or less it. And the foundation itself, it's an independent organization who has as a core business to run uh, top-level domains .se and .nu. So that is the most important thing that we are doing. Um, as you probably know, w should we stop doing this or should we fail in any way that will be quite less noisy on the internet uh, because you couldn't reach the resources that you want to reach? not in an easy way, if you don't have a fantastic memory and remember all the IP addresses you need. So, <clears throat> that is mainly what we do. And lately we have been starting to operate identity federations to make it easier to identify yourself within the Swedish schools, the healthcare sector, uh, and we just connect together the schools, uh, the municipalities, the students, the teachers, Everybody in the same um, management, uh, well, the federation, identity federation. And we are investing in internet developing projects such as Faux Cafe. Information security, I don't know whether you ever have thought about what it really means. So if you see information as an asset, uh, which like every other important business asset that you have, needs to be protected because it has value to an organization. And protected doesn't mean that you have to protect it to any price, but just enough to make you know, the nice balance between what happened, the consequences of a loss, and that will, what that will cost you, um, and the security measure that you take. And you, security means protecting from different things like unauthorized access, use, disclosure, disruption, modification, perusal, inspection, recording, or destruction. This is a very formal definition of information security. But it's good to have in, in, you know, in the back of your minds. Information security cornerstones is availability, data integrity, confidentiality, and traceability. And I used to say, you just choose three or four. You can't get them all. It will be too expensive. Just think of what is the worst thing. Is it that it's your information is not available? Well, that you should sh focus on then. If it, is it that sh nobody should have been able to tamper with it? Well, that would be your focus then. So you have to think about what is the worst thing that can happen. And that is when you need to have a key focus on risk. You need to understand some fundamental principles and apply every day in securing your information. Um, <clears throat> so what exactly is it about information that you are trying to protect? And then you can do this risk-based approach and this very, very easy calculation because there is no perfect security and there is no perfect solution. You just have to make sure that you do good enough. And the best part of it is if you do it good enough, the attackers will go somewhere else. Because it's too much of a fuss for them to try to get hold on your information if you're doing good enough. So what threats are we seeing today? Well, botnets. There's um, a lot of them, and they're huge. I don't know whether you have... Uh, heard, I think it was Windsurf who said, like two years ago, 25% of all computers is part of a botnet. So then you can think about the, the magnitude of this and what they can do, what harm they can do. 
And the botnets are used for distributed denial of service attacks to knock something out. So it's not available for the legal users. Uh, there was a <coughs> sorry. <coughs> there was a record uh, two weeks ago when there was a DDoS attack on the magnitude of 7.3 terabit. And did it last? No, 3.7, I think it was. It was the other way around. That's a lot, anyway. Uh, that didn't last for more than one week, and then we had another DDoS attack that was even bigger. So they have, in some way or another, found a new way to do extraordinary large DDoS attacks, which is a difficulty that is very, very hard to overcome. It's almost impossible to protect yourself from a DDoS attack. You can do, again, your best. And then we have malware, and some of the malware are ransomware. Have you, do you know about ransomware? Yeah. So I don't have to explain that to you. So threats in an information security sense are any activities that represent possible harm to the information that you are about to protect, or the operations that you have to protect. And threats can be thought of as anything that would negatively affect your confidentiality, integrity, availability, and so on, you know. And one of the most dramatic was the Mirai botnet, but that was like two years ago, and since then we have had even more dramatic. But what was the most dramatic thing with the Mirai network was that it affected the domain name system itself, directly. So it was not only any service, it was the cornerstone of the internet service. Not that it managed to knock it out completely, but there were a lot of organizations that were affected and the websites and mail was not re uh, reachable. Yeah. So what should I do as a user? Well, stick to the basics. Craft the perfect password or passphrase policy. Don't try to think too much about password and how they should be shaped. There's no reason to have complexity because if you try to force complexity, the only thing you will achieve is less entropy. Because if you force people to put a special character into the password, they will probably put a question mark or an exclamation mark in the end. <laughs> because it's easy and they can't remember it. What is really, really important to, to tell people is it should be a long password. Don't allow less than 12 characters. In that way, you are suddenly falling out of all these popular spread password leaked databases because most people use short, as short as they are allowed to. Okay? And another thing, try to convince people that unique is good. Have unique passwords for every single service that is important for you. And the third thing is, don't force people to change password ever. That's a bad idea, too, because you will force them to choose too easy, too easy to crack. They will reuse the same password for several sites. Um, so, enough of that. I could go on about passwords forever. <laughs> know the ins and outs of public Wi-Fi networks. Don't connect to any network on a regular cafe. Now I'm not talking about Kafu Cafe, <laughs> and not talking about Ari, <laughs> but still you need to be aware of that they are possibilities to, to intercept uh, open public networks. So keep your secrets to yourself. Use the VPN, virtual private network, and encryption. And don't go on a phishing expedition. Try to not be too tempted to click on links. Even if I send you, you have to see this. It's so funny. I can tell you, you don't have to. You shouldn't. Because you don't know what's behind, unless you can validate my digital signature, since I use PGP. But if you don't know exactly who is behind that email, it could be anyone. Okay? And be in control when online. I used to say, turn on your firewall, your mental firewall. 
That's very important. So security is about restricting access, whether to a physical object, uh, location, information, an application, whatever. It's restricting access. And you should only have access to the things that you need to, for your day-to-day -day work or your hobby, whatever it is. And think twice before opening attachments. Or I saw a, a new one the other day, and that was a um, .iso extension. Very strange. I've never seen that before. And dot ISO is uh, sort of mirroring uh, DVDs and taking um, a copy of that. You know that? Uh, but in that, it was a, a malware, of course. And the thing is with ISO, that will auto run when you click on it. So you're screwed. Sorry for my bad language. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Focus on the value of information. What are your golden eggs? What is it that you really, really need to protect that will be the difference for your business or even your personal life? And the most important thing to protect, it, it is the information. It's not, I mean, a computer is a computer. You can always replace it. But your information, that can be really, really hard to, to replace and get back. So what I usually do, I have these basic ideas. I have the principle of New York's arc. I always expect the worst to keep two of everything. <laughs> and that includes my information, so I have a backup. I have actually two. And the Darwinism, people do mistakes, and sometimes there are serious ones, and you don't want to be a casualty on the way. And to have a strategy with robust systems, time-based security, and incident response, because things will happen. So when it happens, what will you do? What will be your action plan? How do you cope with an incident? And um, then I have as an information security officer, I have a principal rule I deny first. And if they really, really have a good argument, then I can allow later when I look through it, is it really a good idea to download this software application or um, uh, have this survey or whatever it is. I mean, just think twice. It's really useful sometimes. This is one of my favorite sites. Um, this is a site called informationisbeautiful.net, I think it is. And this part shows world, the world's biggest data breaches. And uh, even Sweden managed to get in there with the transport agency. But this one, Equifax, is probably the most expensive data breach ever. They are still counting the cost after the consequences of Equifax. You can, if you go to this site and you browse over one of these bubbles, you get more information. It's really interesting. I can stay there forever, just you know, read about things that people have been doing. What was the address? It's beautiful.net. But you can, you can uh, just use your favorite search engine and go for the world's biggest data breaches. And I know what the root cause is. It's people. Because we are buggy. We don't always think properly. Sometimes we get carried away. And sometimes, actually, people are, are able to, to trick us. They are starting to be very good at this. The phishing mail today is getting better and better, harder and harder to, to see through. Um, one of my favorite tricks to do that is I never ever run HTML email. I always have plain text because that's the only way to see, not the only way, but easily see uh, how, where it's from. Who's the sender? Does it have anything with the message to do? And then I look to um, look into the language, and if I have a message starting with "Dear taxpayer," I know it's fake. I mean, come on, the taxation agency would never call me dear. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. And <clears throat> to be honest, the internet is too complex to secure, and one of the reasons is it's too complex to understand fully. It's the biggest engine that has been built. This was 
stated by my, my house god, Bruce Schneier, 2001, it's still valid, of course. But that doesn't mean that you shouldn't try. So I will now, <laughs> after this preaching about information security, tell you more about DNSSEC. Uh, Paul Mogapetris invented DNS uh, and implemented the first name server in 1983. And already in 1990, the security researcher Steve Bellowin find a way to in, in, in say, what do you say? Hmm. I will have. Okay, inject false information into the DNS system because when you are using DNS, you need to trust the response you get back from the name server, and if that is tampered with then you don't know where you will end up, and you have no way to tell it. And that is with the websites. It's even worse with email, because someone can actually get into the middle, reroute uh, the traffic, tamper your email, and just further it, uh, forward it to the receiver, and you will not notice. You have no idea. So, and in that time, internet was populated by people who were good. All of them. And they knew each other by name or by position. And for that reason, they managed to withheld this weakness for five years while working on it to try to find a solution to uh, get it less uh, simple to, to inject false data into DNS. Uh, and that sort of vulnerability was called cache poisoning. So as a top level domain, uh, administrator, we live on trust. That is one of the early IETF RFCs, request for comments, stated. We live on trust, we are the trustees for the delegated domain and have a duty to serve the community. And that is what we are trying to do. So it's not that we own the top level domain. We earn the responsibility to run this. And by doing this as good as possible, uh, we can keep that responsibility. So it's very important for us to do a good, good job. We have had in 20, let's see, 97. Yeah. So in 20 years plus, we have had two major incidents, which is not that much. Do everyone here know about DNS and how it works? More or less? No, okay, well, this is your computer and your morning coffee and you want to get to www.mywebsite.se. So, if this is a brand new computer, you just got it out of the box. Uh, the resolver, who is mostly run by your internet service provider, will help you put a question into DNS. And since uh, this is the first time, you have to go to the root name server uh, because that is the top of the tree of DNS because it's a distributed database that just expands uh, from layer to layer. And um, the root name server will say, no, I have no idea where you will find that website, but I suggest that you ask .se's name servers because they will know, probably. And .se's name server says, well, the address ends with mywebsite.se, so maybe you should check this server. And we give the pointer to the local name server, and the local name server says, of course, I know where you find that web server. It's on the IP address, blah, 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 and then you get the response back. So you can imagine the time that you could expect this to take, but it's instantly, of course. And more like that, if I do this task again in five minutes, my resolver have kept, it cached the response. So I say, okay, I will save this for a while because maybe she wants to go back sometime and then I will get the response even quicker. But that was one of the part that had weakness since it was possible to inject, to get in between with a false response, okay? And uh, the domain system is one of the internet's most important bricks. So we have to protect it, don't we? Um, there's an animated version of how it works. You can find it on uh, YouTube. I won't go into that now. DNS attack tree. I know this is 
not even readable, uh, readable. But the thing is, on this side, you have problems related to availability. On this side, you have problems uh, related to information corruption. So there's different threats that you have to cope with. And I will just keep to the left. So DNSSEC is a security extension to the domain name system. It protects internet users from the tampered of fake DNS data, such as DNS cache poisoning and managed middle attacks, as I was explaining earlier. It's also used to securely distribute attributes for other security protocols and solutions. That is something that wasn't in the idea from the beginning. But when you realized that you have you have your own file with its own data, and you sign that, and then suddenly you have a container that is perfectly protected. So why don't you put SSH keys there? Why don't you put your certificates there? Why don't you put your personal anything, whatever you like there, and sign it? And then you have this absolutely amazing distribution system that people in the PKI world will only dream of. They don't have that. And it's already there. So it's, where it's used a lot now for, for instance, protecting email. You have uh, Dane and DMARC, SPF policies. Everything you can put in DNS and you sign it and off you go. So it's very useful. And a lot of other internet protocols are depending on DNS. <coughs> But the information in DNS has become so vulnerable uh, to attacks that you can't trust it any longer, unless you do something about it. And DNSSEC makes use of cryptographic signatures to make sure that DNS responses come from the correct source and that data hasn't been manipulated during transfer. Okay? And you can read more about it in this um, standard protocol RFC. Requ you know what that RFC stands for? Request for comments? So there you can read more about it on a general level. So why do we need DNSSEC? Why do we want DNSSEC? Well, with DNSSEC you will get the same domain validated trust as you will from a certification authority, but you don't have to trust them. You can trust yourself and know what kind of operations you run. Um, rev revocation, for instance, takes place immediately. If the key is not in the zone file any longer, it's gone. It's revoked in a very good manner. So it gives you a more robust and reliable internet infrastructure. No more lies in DNS with DNSSEC. Unless you have someone on the inside and put in false information in your zone file and then you sign it, well, then you have signed false data. Doesn't help much. Uh, but that's another, that's another problem. It's not tampered from A to B, from the resolver to the name server and back, which is the main point of this. So the trust we built on top of DNS is, is something you gain from, and it will eliminate the CA threshold um, actually for the large scale of secure communication that is possible with DNS. And Sweden was the first top-level domain to implement DNSSEC in 2005. By then, <coughs> I had been working with it since 1999, when we had our first project, and IETF engineers started to work on the protocol, and uh, we had some workshops, and uh, we tried to, you know, make implementations of the protocol, and we did big fail, nothing worked, so it was back to the office, back to the programmers and, and keyboards, uh, <coughs> and then... Um, I think it was 2001 that we had something that was working that we could actually implement and try for real. And though then we started to have a copy of the internet, we played around and said, we are the internet. We had a smaller one. Uh, and um, people who are friendly users, early adopters, started to try it out. And we had that working for a couple of years. And we know by then this will work. And we told to our native service providers that six months after the standard is ready and, and uh, accepted, you will be ready. And they were. So we managed to get this working very quickly. And then a lot of others started to think about DNSSEC. And they started to think about DNSSEC and they thought about the DNSSEC and didn't do much because, you know, it's really scary 
to start to touch DNS in, in a way that you suddenly don't know how it works. And DNS adds complexity. No question about that. But in my view, it actually puts DNS in the forum, in the living room, from being in the wardrobe, with no, nobody touched it, you know, they didn't update the name service um, software, <coughs> name service software that just, you know, had this post-it note saying, it works, don't touch it. And now you had to be more, pay more attention to DNS, which I think, personally, is a very, very good thing. But while people were still thinking, and we were working with the ICANN, the root soon administrator, that they should sign the root soon because that will simplify the whole key management thing. Because we were, by 2005, the top of the tree. We were the top of the trust chain. So everybody has had to rely on us and our key management. And if the root could do that, well, we could be less important in, in the entire chain. But they, they had so much to think about, and they didn't really find a reason until 2008. And the Kaminsky bug, poor guy, this is Kaminsky. He's a security researcher, and now he's called the Kaminsky bug. Whatever, he was the one who, who found out that it was really, it went from like days uh, to do this cash poisoning attack to minutes he found a way to do it very, very much easier than before. And the whole DNS community just shivered. And they thought, oh my god, we have to do something. And DNSSEC is the answer. So then the interest started really, really to grow. And that means more and more TLDs got the zone file signed which means that the poor resolver operator needed to keep track on every top-level domain's key to be able to validate the signatures. And that started to become very, very tricky because those TLDs had also the habit to change their role keys from time to time, just to make sure that the key cannot be um, tampered or, or um, what do you say? Disclosed. Disclosed, thank you. <laughs> <coughs> and DNS handles authentication of origin, the authentication of the source. You know exactly from what name server and domain that response come from. So it's very fine data integrity. Um, it gives you authenticated response to queries and about non-existing domains, which was also a very tricky part. How do you know that you don't get a response for a domain that doesn't really exist? So we had to find out a way to calculate, okay, this is the domain before, the one that you question for, and this is the one after, and there's nothing in between, so you have asked for a non-existing domain. So it took some time for the engineers to find out how to cope with that. But it does this for DNS data only, nothing else. It's not solving the, the world starvation or, or things like that. You, you shouldn't have too high expectations on what DNS is doing. It protects DNS. And we managed also to very, very early convince our ISPs to turn on validation so they actually checked the signature. Because if I sign something and you don't check the validity of the signature, you haven't won anything. But the ISPs in Sweden, Telia was the first one. We worked very close with them and they started to validate. Very good. I was so proud of them because that was very brave. DNS can't handle some other stuff and confidentiality, for instance, is one of them. Uh, all DNS information is open and uh, it's not encrypted uh, or protected in any other means, but they are working on that right now within the IATF because the world has become such a mad place. Uh, it doesn't handle verification of the identity of the person behind the domain name, the registrant, the one who has actually registered. And as for anything else, I mean, DNS doesn't stop criminals from using the internet. They will sign their domains too. They will use certificates. They will use encryption. They do. 
already. And I all, very often get this question, how secure is DNSSEC? Well, it is as secure as you make it. It is as secure as the underlying cryptographic algorithm. If you choose a bad algorithm, it's not very secure. And the implementation, if you don't manage to implement it in a good way, it's not very secure. And if you don't operate it in a good way, to, as I said, have it in the living room, looking after it from time to time, then it's not very secure. But finally, the internet route soon was signed in 2010, after we have been bugging them for a long time, writing long formal letters, it's time for you to take the responsibility that blah, 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 blah. So yeah, we did that from time to time and they managed to. And after years of pressure, it became signed in uh, June 2010. Uh, and since I've been such a, a stubborn person and actually been after them for such a long time, they returned uh, with a, a call out for people who would like to man help to manage or operate their root zone DNSSEC. And I was like, yay! So I applied. Um, <clears throat> and we had two Swedish people who were part of the designing of how to protect the DNSSEC trust anchor for the world. And how sh can we make the entire world to trust the way it's done? The Chinese, the Russians, the Americans, the Puerto Ricans, whatever. All of them have to trust the same idea. So what they did was starting a trusted community representation sort of design. So a trusted community representative um, with strong technical knowledge on the internet, uh, which was not a determining factor. The selected TCRs are expected to be committed to the security of the DNS and knowledgeable or committed to becoming knowledgeable about the environment in which ICANN operates and the technical functions for which ICANN has responsibilities. Uh, and there was, you had to be sane and, you know, probably well known and in, in your part of the world um, to become one of these TCRs. And the criteria was personals, persons of integrity, objectivity and intelligence <laughs> with repetitions for sound judgment and open mind. This was some sort of hard to measure those criteria, I think, but still anyway. Um, and I did understand the DNS and DNSSEC since I've been working with it for such a long time. And people who could uh, help ICANN to represent the broadest culture and geographic diversity. I'm the only woman, still, which is, you can just have a question about that. Uh, I hope that will change, because I will not be there forever. I've been doing this for now soon 10 years, and uh, I am not about to work forever. So I will step down, and then there will be only guys. What they did, how, I did have a full hour. Uh, no, uh, no? We, we, we 45 minutes and we started kind of, kind of late. S <laughs> okay, I will, <laughs> I will, okay, I will go do this quick, I'm sorry. Um, Which is sad because this is the best part. This is the best part, yeah. I thought, um, I'm so sorry. Okay, I could go through it. They had two sites, in the U both are in the US. This is on the West Coast, and this is on the East Coast, where I belong. This is Terramark, Culpeper, Virginia, a small little city outside Washington, one hour by car. We have focused on physical security because the key for the NSEC is never connected to the internet. It's an off net uh, operation. So we have different tiers, uh, the key sermon room, the vestibule, and the safe room. <coughs> and this is what the details look like. The walls between are very well protected, and the cages and bars and all these signs, you cannot, you cannot uh, use firearms. But the first time we were there, there was an armed uh, guard in, in the entrance, on the entrance to this cage. No food or drink is a lie too, because the first ceremony took like six to eight hours. And with no food and drinks, that would be terrible, because we couldn't leave. We were not allowed to, except in very, very uh, controlled forms. 
And there's a physical control that means two individuals jointly for each operation, separation of duties, uh, external monitoring, there's cameras everywhere, uh, there's sensors uh, for movements, seismic, and others, and much, much more in these physical controls. And this is what the safe room looks like, the two different safes. The interesting thing is they are bolted to the floor, so you cannot really, really move them if you would like to. And in safe number one, we have all the equipment. Safe number two uh, is holding all the crypto officers' equipment uh, in small boxes and it's get a little bit crowded in there when we do this you know get things out of the safes and we are following a very very strict script so every single thing is you know defined and checked and uh, timed so we have a, a watch on the wall showing UTC time and uh, someone is responsible to just yell out it's uh, 132 133, <laughs> so you can put the right time in your script. <clears throat> Many hundreds of controls, and this is how boring it can get sometimes. Patrick is not very amused, uh, probably very tired. Here's my little box, uh, and you see it's two locks. So the ceremony master uh, also have a key to my box, and I have a key to my box, and we both you know, turn it and open, and in there I have a tamper evident proof bag, which is in plastic, and in that, there is a plastic box, and in the plastic box, there is two smart cards. One to generate a new zone signing keys, and the other one to generate key signing keys, and, and to allow for more uh, crypto officers. Um, and here's the deposit box. <coughs> all, the, all the equipment are in tamper-proof evident bags, as you see. And we always check the seals very carefully to make sure that nobody had been there um, touching the stuff. So I'm carefully checking my bags before I take out my smart card to be sure that nobody has been touching it. And here's the HSM. Uh, it is shown on the screen on the wall. So to make sure, again, that people know exactly what happens. It's very transparent, it's recorded and streamed, and you can go back to ICANN's website and, uh, or IANA's website and have a look if you want. Um, it's, everything is very carefully marked. That is an HSM, <laughs> and here's the cable. And the interesting part of this cable is um, it's all these things are scaled off because you don't want to suspect that anyone had been tampered with the contact itself. So it's just we took off all the things around it to make sure that it's stripped. And here are the smart cards. We always need to be three people there uh, to be able to operate the HSM. Because that is what the smart cards do. It activates the HSM. So the, the Encryption keys is within the HSM, and if anyone tampers with the, the HSM, it will just erase everything, which happened once. Someone was a little bit uncareful. But we have two of everything. You remember Noah's Ark? <laughs> um, <clears throat> so, yeah, all the equipment are redundant. And roll up your sleeves. That was also something. The, the guy who is the ceremony master here, he was forced to always roll up his sleeves so he didn't have anything hidden. And we have a representative from, from their sign because they are the ones who put the Zoom file uh, on the net. And their sign sends uh, in advance a key signing request. And he has, every time, even though I met him like 20 times, he has to identify himself with his passport and tell who he, who he is. And, uh, read the PGP word list from his paper, because that is made in advance, and we compare that to the one that would be the result from the operation and validated by the people in the room. So there are different roles during the ceremony. <coughs> the ceremony master, internal witnesses, which is staff observing and recording you know, manage the cameras and stuff, and make notes of anomalies. If anything happens, any exception, they have to write that down. So someone slammed the door a little bit hard once on the safe, which uh, made the seismic sensor to be activated, and everything locks. You cannot get out of the room, because there will never be a suspicion about that anyone could get in there 
that shouldn't. So they were locked in, and it took us some hour to figure out how to get them out. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So a lot of these um, roles, it, we are about 30 people in the room. By the, and the most important part is the crypto officer who has the physical keys to these safety boxes uh, to activate. And there's another gang that will probably never be activated, and that is the key recovery shareholders. They are, they ro their role is to be able to bootstrap a new HSM, should we not be able to go to the US, since both sides are there. I don't, you don't know now with, with uh, Mr. Trump. Uh, so I don't have the key to the internet, but I have a key to the safety box where I keep my smart cards. Uh, and I'm very proud of being able to be a part of this key ceremony, actually. And I'm sorry that I missed the time. I, there's so much to tell about this, though. But I will be around for a short... Do we have a break now? Yes. Yeah. So, big round of applause. Big round of applause. Thank you. Thank you for listening.